GCSE results published yesterday. Hundreds of thousands of teenagers across Britain got their results after two years of disrupted schooling due to the pandemic. And this year's GCSE cohort, of course, were the first candidates to sit physical exams since 2019. But amid the many celebrations and commiserations, there was a sobering warning from the head of the Association of Colleges, who said pupils whose education has been blighted by school closures could be at risk of dropping out of sixth form courses, that important pathway to university and other vocational courses and apprenticeships because of poor English and maths skills. Well, I'm joined now by Tom Richard, uh, who's director of EDS, EDSK Education Think Tank and a former government advisor on education. And Tom Slater of Spike magazine is still with us. Tom Richmond, let's ask you first the kind of damage that you think lockdown did to kids' education. My son Ned just sat his GCSEs after two years of lockdown. It was tough for him. I'm sure it was much, much tougher for less privileged kids. You think this will now go on into the sixth form with kids not being able to meet the more rigorous challenges of sixth form study because of lockdown? Yeah, I think that's undoubtedly the case. We've got data to back that up now. So alongside the national GCSE results that came out yesterday, the government also released some data along with the exam regulator Ofqual, which showed that actually we have seen a genuine dip in pupils' English and math skills over the past two years during the pandemic. And of course, not only that, but the pupils who sat their GCSEs and A-levels this summer because like you're saying, they're the first pupils to have sat those exams for a few years. They haven't really had a chance to practice these very high stakes exams, which means so much potentially to their futures. So we've kind of got a double combination here of students not necessarily having the teaching that they really wanted. And of course, schools and colleges were desperately unlucky with just not being able to deliver that to the standard they wanted. But now we've got a situation these students will be progressing, not just onto college, but think about the students going on to university as well. If we know that students' English and math skills have suffered recently, what about all the other subjects? They might even be going on to study for three years at university. It's a cumulative problem, and that's why lots of policy experts and academics are very worried about this. And on top of this, of course, Tom Richmond, we've also got those thousands of so-called ghost children, kids who obviously stopped going to school during lockdown because their parents were told not to send them to school, and they haven't yet returned to school. Tens of thousands of kids, surely. Local authorities should be going around knocking on doors and saying to parents, can you send your kid back to school, please? Yeah, and this is where the government has actually been trying to give themselves some more legal powers recently because they know that home education was a thing before the pandemic. Of course, we know there were some people who preferred that route. But like you say, it's the scale of the issue now. There has been an absolute explosion in numbers in relative terms from 2019 to where we are now. And the worrying thing is that we just don't know how well a lot of kids are doing. And I don't just mean it in an academic sense. I mean, in terms of their pastoral support, are they being looked after at home? Are they getting fed well? All those services that schools are now really having to deal with when before the pandemic, there was a lot wider support network available to these young kids. So we often talk about it as a safeguarding problem. It is potentially very serious. And so I think the government's absolutely right to say that we need to know what's happening with these home education because we can't just say to parents, you can choose whatever you want and simply nobody will ask any questions. If we want to make sure these kids get academic support with English and maths, as well as being looked after properly, we've got to be attacking it on both fronts, I think. Tom Richmond, it strikes me that back in the spring of 2020, when lockdown first happened, um, as soon as the teaching union said, we're not going to send teachers to school, we're scared that they're going to catch COVID from the kids. The government didn't have much choice when it came to closing down schools. You've worked in government, you're a very well connected chap. Do you think it's possible now that there could be a repeat of lockdown if there's another pandemic? Or do you think the damage is so great now, it's acknowledged to be so huge that we'll never shut down schools again? I mean, you're absolutely right that we know the damage has been huge now. We know that we need to keep all pupils of all ages in school and indeed at universities and colleges as much as we possibly can. When we talk about learning loss in the academic literature, you're talking about, quite rightly, GCSE and A-level results. 
But think about those primary school pupils. Here we are talking about English and math skills in terms of maybe GCSE performance. But what about those primary school pupils who haven't yet learned how to read, write, and count? And that's where, if the damage is done early in a pupil's education, we know there's a huge knock-on effect right through primary school into secondary. And that's why I don't think there's any appetite at all now for schools to close again and colleges to close again. Universities are perhaps slightly better set up for online learning, but again, there's not a big appetite from university students to go back to online learning either. So there's a genuine will to now make sure this doesn't happen again. If there are any reasons to, sco sorry, to close schools and colleges and universities again, we're probably better set up now for things like online learning than we were back in 2019, but there's no doubt the best thing is to have an expert teacher standing at the front of your classroom in front of the kids. We desperately need to hold on to that, I think. Tom Slater in the studio. Some of us, I know it spiked on my Planet Normal podcast at The Telegraph. We warned about the dangers of lockdown, not just for health, but education too. It was interesting when Nadim Zahawi was Education Secretary, I think he was the first senior government figure to say it was a mistake to lock down schools. Liz Truss has just said in the last few days it was a mistake to lock down schools. Rishi Sunak's given an interview to The Spectator saying that he tried to stop lockdown. Mm -hmm. Do you think that schools will ever be locked down again, given the huge damage this did to kids' education? I think if we only learn one lesson from lockdown, surely the school's part of it has to be it. Mm. I mean, it seemed like such a crazy suggestion, even at the beginning of this, you know, the least vulnerable group, essentially. Also, there are all kind of things that have to carry on, even in a time of lockdown. You have to keep the supermarkets open. Why do we not also have to keep the schools open? Mm. That should have been the presumption, because it was obvious to almost anyone of the damage this would do, and also of the inequality it would accentuate and widen. And whether it's talking about the results, whether it's talking about the ghost children phenomenon, that's what we're seeing exacerbated in so many different respects as a consequence of obvious dangers with closing schools in the first place. And now we've got teachers unions saying they're going to strike. I mean, in Scotland, the teaching unions are talking about a perfect storm of strikes across all four nations of the UK in schools, as if kids' education hasn't been disrupted enough. I think the thing with the teaching unions is if we hadn't had the past two years where they kind of utterly destroyed any moral kind of credibility they once have had, they could have had an argument yeah. quite straightforwardly, maybe want a bit of public support over teachers' pay. Obviously, I think there's a lot of support for teachers, there's a lot of support for education, but I think the leadership of the teaching unions in particular, because of how they acted over the course of the pandemic, is going to make many people think they haven't necessarily got their children's best interests at heart in terms of leadership, that is. Tom Richmond, perhaps a contentious question to you. Of course, there is a lot of public support and respect for teachers. Many of us feel that teachers should be paid more, but you're an education industry insider. Do you think these threats of strike action by teachers could come to pass? Well, at the moment, we've already got one of the main unions, the NASUWT, saying they're going to ballot their members in the autumn. I mean, all, all the coverage you've rightly been giving to this uh, cost of living crisis today with the energy price rises, we know that's going to hit everybody hard. But teaching is not a very well paid profession. The government, to their credit, are trying to increase the salaries for starting teachers to £30,000 over the next couple of years. But again, I still don't think that's going to be enough to placate you know, the unions and indeed new teachers in the meantime. So I think at the moment we're looking at a very, very difficult and confrontational autumn. We, of course, will have a new education secretary in a couple of weeks from now. And I think top of their entry in terms of the school system is probably going to be how do we keep things going? Because I think the teaching unions are absolutely right that they're going to be balloting members. They're, I think they're being very honest about it up front. But I think that's also a pretty realistic threat from their perspective. It strikes me, Tom, the teaching unions are, you know, growling, you, you know, civil service unions, obviously health unions, BMA, nurses unions. We can have a wave of public strikes or strikes this autumn, couldn't we, that will really test the mettle of this new Tory prime minister at a time when there's a cost of living crisis and an energy crisis on top of that. It's going to be a really difficult time, but at the same time, I think, you know, you can see that not only in terms of the unions themselves, but just the kind of rank and file members of those unions, they are suffering these economic pressures as much as anyone else. They have, have witnessed that kind of fall in living standards. They're looking at their own energy bills. And whilst it's another kind of problem piled on top, you know, aside from being teachers, aside from being union members, they are also members of the public struggling with this cost mm, of living mm. crisis. And that's why I think the politics of these strikes is now so different to what it has been in recent years. Mm. You're seeing more public support for it because people yep. do feel like they're in the same boat. Indeed. Same.